Welcome, um, everyone. Uh, so uh, today we had the pleasure of having Professor Maria Micaela Sviatsky. Uh, she's an assistant professor uh, of economics at Princeton University. Uh, she's an affiliate at the CES I4 Research Network, the NBR Development and Political Econom Economy Group, the African School of Economics, and the International Crisis Group. Uh, Professor Biaski research interests are labor and development economics uh, with a focus on human capital, gender violence, and crime. And uh, today uh, she's going to uh, present her paper um, with on market structure and uh, extra extortion. So, uh, Professor Siaski, uh, the floor is. Thank you so much, Teresa, for the presentation. So I'm very happy to present this uh, new work, which is joined with Zach Brown, Eduardo Montero, and Carlos Smith Padilla. So. As many of you know, organized crime and extortion are common aspects of life in many countries. This is from developing to developed countries. So extortion is actually the main source of revenue of green organizations. In the particular case of gangs that I'm going to talk today in El Salvador, it's the main source of revenue. And it is estimated that about like 70% of firms pay extortion. So this is a big share having like big implications for the economy. However, we know very little about the effects of gang competition, so whether gangs are competing or not on extortion and whether they pass through to consumers. And this is important because there are many instances where uh, governments facilitate this cooperation between criminal organizations, mainly to reduce violence, so they induce them to sign these pacts, and also enforcement itself may generate incentives for gangs to collude and not to compete. So why we know very little about this? Well, the main challenge is how we measure extortion. No? Extortion is very difficult to measure systematically. We rarely observe it and it's very, uh, sorry, it's difficult to observe for us and also is rarely reported to the police. For example, in El Salvador, only a very small share of extortion victims ever report incidents to the police. This is mainly because they don't trust, they, are, they have fear of retaliation. So it's very difficult to measure this. So this means that we don't have a complete understanding about how the economics of extortion works for criminal organizations. So today I'm going to try to answer three questions. One is how do gangs determine extortion rates? So I'm going to present you some briefly descriptive analysis, and then I'm going to move to analyze how does gang competition matter for extortion? Does it matter whether they are competing or not for territory for the extortion rates? And what are the downstream effects or incidents of extortion on consumers and firms? So how we are going to do this is we are going to exploit this very uh, rich data from a leading wholesale distribution company in El Salvador. They have very little data on revenue and cost for each product retailer. And most important for us, it has the location and payment of about more than 50,000 incidents of extortion. How it works in El Salvador is that gangs require drugs to pay extortion in order to deliver to an area. So if you are a company working in El Salvador, you will need to pay extortions to deliver to certain retailers. The second thing that we are going to explore to try to answer the question about how does gang competition matter for extortion is we are going to exploit this 2016 non-aggression pact. This I'm showing you the homicides and years. And what you can see is that in 2016, yes, Horacio. Yes, uh, uh, before before you go. Yes. This part on the on the main uh, of the question number one, do you um, so, so the general model you're considering is a model where um, there is just a competition between this. So what is the dimensions over which these uh, gangs compete? Uh, you know, do they behave like? Uh, Toyota and Honda and Ford that they have uh, customers and they, uh, so is there a demand for services that they offer? No, so what we are doing is, is a different of the model that when we started this, we have a model about competition for services, for providing like different services. In this case would be protection, no, to these different companies. We started thinking about that. <laughs> then we went to a reality and that's not how, how it is. In general, the guys compete for extortion, for territory to extort. 
And I'm going to explain a bit more about, about that in a couple of yes. slides. Uh, but basically, the competition is over the territory. That allows them then to extort. And you can think about that competition. And then what we are assuming is that the distribution company is a monopolist. And what are the means to compete? I guess it's not price. It's, uh, it's just gun. <laughs> Yes, exactly. It's violence. And this is a very important feature because that's how we are going to define our competition measure. So basically how they compete is the use of violence. And, that, and that's a, a very important feature. So, um, Okay, so another aspect that you could be thinking that they can compete is the provision of public goods. We, in the case of San Salvador, I, I don't know if you remember these other papers I presented a couple of years ago, we don't see anything about them uh, competing, you know, to provide again and gain protection for the populations so that they don't call the police or something. So they provide more, uh, more services to them. We don't find anything of that. So that's why we are not putting that into the model here. So as I was saying before, to answer the second question about how gun competitions matter for extortion, what we are going to do is to exploit this pact that happened in 2016 where basically gangs decided to not invade each other's territory. I'm going to provide more details also in a couple of slides. But these are the two things that we are exploiting, the data on extortion and then this exogenous variation on whether they are competing or not. So as a preview of what we find, for the first question, we see empirical evidence consistent with price discrimination by gangs. It's not that they charge a fixed uh, fee for delivery, actually, the, 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 what they are charging is based on observable local characteristics, so basically on downstream demand. And for the second question, we actually see that once they sign this pact, we see that extortion rates increase by 20% in areas with, that were having before gun competition. And again, this gun competition is based on this homicide that I'm going to describe in a couple of slides. Then in terms of what do we see, what happens with firms and consumers, we actually see that the distribution company we find a substantial pass-through of extortion to retailers, especially for those that are close to the extortion location where they are with distribution companies extorted. And we also see that for pharmaceutical, which is the, 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 the ones that we can observe prices that we have in the data, we observe that after the non-aggression pact, prices increase and hospital admissions for associated diseases where the price increase also increase. Sorry, yes. sorry to be persistent at this. Yeah. But um, so your second bullet point here, mm -hmm. uh, it says that they are also competing on price. So, yeah, sure, they compete on, on with guns, but they also, because you say when, when the competition goes down, the price is increasing. Yes, the price increase, but it's not something that they are using for the competition with the other. It's not that now, since you have one, so the, what we have behind, and I will go over that on the mechanisms, is that what happens is that before you were competing for territory, no? Like you were, and you were using violence. So when you were using resources, and now once you're not competing, these resources are free. So you can dedicate kind of these economies of scope. That's how it, what we have in the model. Now you can use more resources to the extortion activities, to do threats of violence, like to, to get a higher extortion amount. That's what we are using. Especially if we rule out that other model that you have in your mind about like them competing for prices, because when we check on the data for the years that we have available, we see that per delivery, it's not that they are paying multiple guns. They always pay the same gun. The difference is that when they are competing, it could be one and then another one. So okay. basically they compete for the territory. But, but there could be an equilibrium. Yes. But anyway, I'll, I'll wait to see what, uh, what you show us. Okay, perfect. No, but that's an important point. And it, it, it took us also, when we asked the firm whether, <laughs> we asked them like whether to the distribution company, when, if they saw something that now they could choose, like who to pay. And they were actually, they laughed at us and were like saying, we never choose who to pay. It's just we pay whoever is there before we make a delivery. But I will explain more of this and maybe I, we can include some of this of your thoughts, Horacio. Okay. So this is related to a big literature. In particular, it's very related to all the government corruption and bribery, where there is a lot about how competition for government bribes work. Here we are adding because we are talking not about government officials, but actually criminal actors. 
Also, there is a big literature on drug markets and gangs, whether <clears throat> when you, once you have competition, what happens with violence. But we know very little about what happens with uh, the main business of these criminal organizations, in this case, extortion. And also is related to this uh, literature that looks at the effects of cartels convicted by antitrust authorities of legal cart or legal cartels. And here the difference is that we are examining like collusion, like in an illegal market where gangs compete using violence, which is something that doesn't happen that much, at least in the legal sector. So let me give you, I'm going to give you a lot of background. So feel free to stop me and ask a, any questions. I prepare actually like for a short presentation so that I can be stopped and you can ask me more things. So what we know about Crown of El Salvador is that <clears throat> it's known as one of the most violent peacetime countries in the world. In 2015, it had an homicide rate of 103 per 100,000 population. This was a very high homicide rate. Today, it's kind of low. And the homicide, this violence is mostly due to two gangs. It's not that they have multiple gangs across the country. It's actually two, which are the MS-13 and Barrio 18, which account for about 90% of the gang membership. And these gangs are present in all the country. So they have like cells in almost all municipalities. And much of the violence can be traced back to this activity, which is extortion. As the ICG report put there, extortion is the economic engine behind the gangs and violence. They do some of drugs, but what they said is that the main business that they have is extortion. And basically these gangs fight and compete for territory in order to extort people. And they may also use violence to collect extortion. So how does it work for distribution firms? So transportation and distribution companies are often a big target of this extortion. Gangs require trucks to pay extortion to deliver to an area. So here is more extortion payments as rights to deliver. It's not that tolls to pass through in this case. Like if you remember all the model of the government official, these were more like tolls. Here it's different because the trucks are often stopped inside streets prior to making a delivery rather than in the main avenue or highway. And in general, and this was the point that for as was important when getting all this qualitative evidence is that the distributors generally only pay one gun to make a delivery. And this is because guns have exclusive control over some part of the territory. So the trucks, once they go, cannot choose which gun to pay when making a delivery. So basically the guns compete over territory rather than competing to provide protection. And what happens? Yes, Paula. Uh, protection from what? Protection from the other gang? Yeah, exactly. Because that's other, the other model that you could be thinking, which is, okay, you pay me this amount, but I protect you for this other gang. But that is not how it works, at least in, not in this context. Okay, so I had a follow-up question from yes. earlier. I wanted to see if you uh, explain it. When you showed us the graph very early on in the presentation, uh, there seems to be a lot of variation over time in extortions and you show us that there is a huge, um, you know, it plummets in 2016, but there was another discontinuity that you had yes. marked, which was uh, 2012. But in general, after 2012, which is the first time you see dropping, it goes up for a long period of time and it's erratic, but it's quite steady. And at some point it's a very sharp yes. increase before it falls again. Yes. So if you could just explain just a little bit in addition to these um, non-aggression pacts, what else is a major yes, driver will, of- I will come to this in, Three slides, okay. I think. So to explain okay. to you, it was homicides, actually, what I was showing. And yes, I can explain you why there it went down. It's actually quite okay. important. So Thank you. just to finish this, so what happens if they decide not to pay? Now you can say, okay, why I cannot pay? And that's it. But actually, the, the consequence can be very extreme. And this is a, one news, like just to put you an example of what happened when one driver that he was basically distributing bread in a community, he said, I don't want to pay. So what happened is they burn their, their car and they turn their car into fire. So this can be very extreme. So it's not that you can decide not to pay. At most, you can decide not to deliver, which you would see that in the case of our distribution company, it's a bit more difficult for them to decide not to deliver to an area. And here is where it comes to your question, Paula. So the other thing that I said I was going to exploit is this gang cooperation. And actually, there is a history in El Salvador that of gang cooperation. And the first one, it was a truce, which this one in 2012, 
was uh, negotiated by the government. In March 2012, the government sat down with the leaders of these gangs. Interestingly, the leaders of these gangs are in jail, so they can't know who they are, so they can sit down with them and negotiate. And basically, they negotiated better conditions for gangs in exchange of a reduction in violence. The next day that a truce was negotiated, they saw a big decline in homicides. This was done under secrecy. Nobody knew, it was not that civilians knew about this truce. What happened is that in 2013, they learned about this truce because there was this uh, journalistic investigation that showed and said like, look, the government is negotiating with terrorist group. People were uh, like, they didn't like this. So the truce was broken and they start increasing also coercion against gangs. Gangs also start like fighting more for territory because it was more difficult because they increased police, and that's why you are seeing this increase. But at the same time, what they said is that this truce, even though it was broken in 2013, this set up the grounds for them to negotiate. Basically, uh, during the truce, what the government used a lot were religious leaders from each community so that they could, like, you know, make feasible this truce. Uh, to reduce violence. And they kept using those to keep meeting and to try to, to coordinate. And this actually materialized in April 2016 when the gangs went out and they said like to, to, to journalists and to newspapers saying like with this announcement that now they agreed not to fight and compete for existing territory. And what we see is that this decline. And up to today, they think that they are still are, they say that they are still under cooperation. And you can see that these homicides are still decline, in decline. So importantly, when it was the other truce of 2012, many people is, is speculated that even though homicides declined, uh, it increased extortion. One theory was that the gang truce was really an effort by larger criminal interests to grant kind of more breathing room to these criminal operations to do their business. So, and we find a lot of anecdotal evidence in the field that suggests that for gangs, it is costly to kind of do the two things, like to fight the rival gang and collect extortion. And this is mainly because they have limited resources. For them, it's difficult to recruit people. Collecting extortion is costly, and especially costly when you are under competition because you are targeted by the rival gang, you know, for, uh, to fight. And in general, when they, there are a lot of surveys back then, so the things where Salvadorans largely believe that the truce benefit the guns. And this was, is one of the potential reasons of why this truce in 2012 was very unpopular, because extortion was still widespread. So even though violence declined, many of these communities were saying, we are still kind of kidnapped in the situation where we have to pay extortion to these guns. So let me give you now more details on the data descriptive. And I will also go more details about how this extortion works in particular for the distribution company that we analyze. So what do we have? We have here extortion payment data and sales data from this wholesale distribution company from 2012 to 2019. So can, what can I tell you about this company is that it's one of the main suppliers of both consumer products and pharmaceuticals. They uh, buy the goods in bulk uh, from multinationals and they resell them to local retailers and pharmacies. Importantly, they have exclusive licensing rights with these multinationals and this allows them to be the only distributor for some of the goods, especially for pharmaceuticals. This is all what I can provide you of information without uh, breaking the confidential agreement with the company, but I think this is important. But you can ask me more and I can try to to guide if you have any questions about the company. So what do they do? The distribution company, and this is something actually that many of the other distribution companies that we interview, they say they do, is that they subcontract drivers and trucks. And in general, they try to put very little of the company identification in the trucks. And since El Salvador is small, what, uh, what they do is the trucks leave the warehouse and they return each day. So we have about 90,000 trips, more than 2 million deliveries to retailers or pharmacies. So how does it work, the extortion? So this company, this institution company in particular, and also the other ones, they have 
kind of their own security police. So they have a robust security team that monitors each track and negotiate with the guys. So you, this is super costly for the company because they have to have their own security team inside. So how it works is that the driver goes in the trucks you know, to go and to do the delivery. And prior to a delivery, someone that is a gang representative collects extortion and asks for an extortion amount. What the driver has to do in that moment is not, he doesn't have to negotiate it himself. He has to tell the person, we need to call the security team and they will negotiate with you. So he calls the security team, confirms the amount and receipt of payments, okay? In very few cases, at least that we could see in our data, the extortion amount is pre-negotiated for a given period, like monthly or weekly. And we ask why they were having this system and instead of putting, you know, security to these drivers, like a police officer there or something. And what they emphasize is that this system ensures safety of drivers and reduces also the fraud of the drivers. And that's why they do it this way. They said in the past, when they tried to increase security of the driver to come with another like guard, this generated more problems. And you may be thinking uh, extortion is illegal and this in El Salvador, but the distribution company has reported extortion to the attorney general office. So they have all this data. So they know that this is going. So how does it look? This is a map of El Salvador. And here we have all the extortion payments. As you can see, a lot of places do extortion payments. These companies stop and how to pay extortion. And also there is a lot of variation on what they are paying. Sometimes it's something very, just to give you the exact numbers in the next slide, something is likely like 50 cents that you can pay. And sometimes it's like something, a larger amount like $140. And the average truck pays extortion at about $14 per route in a day, which can seem small because we were like, oh, this is not that much. When you... But then when we compare it with the cost, for instance, of like the daily labor cost of the truck driver, it's not, it's actually kind of similar. So what sorry, we did... Sorry, yes. so the payments are per, per trip or per day? It's, it's per, no, it's not per trip. It's actually, it's per delivery, the payment. Exactly. So every time, it's not that they negotiate, and this is something that we saw, it's not that they negotiate a payment per route, these, these gangs, so they don't act that centralized. Actually, we even check in the correlates whether what you are paying in the same route, that the, the same route that the driver is doing, whether the payment that he's doing first is correlated with the extortion amount of the other payments, and we don't see any correlation. So it's really related with this local downstream demands, with where is the place where you are delivering, if it is a rich area or not. Uh, okay, so we take all this data of extortion and we combine it also with the sales data. And the first thing that we wanted to do was, okay, let's see what correlates with extortion focusing on the nearest sale. And as I was just saying before to Teresa, what well, the first thing that we see is some evidence of price discrimination. So we see that the extortion amount that they pay is increasing in the delivery values. So, sorry, the value of goods at delivery. So it's positively correlated with the value of goods that you have when you are delivering. And interestingly, when we check with the value of goods in track, so you may be thinking, well, maybe they are charging base on what they are having in the track, but it's not that the gangs take the, 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 the effort to open the track and try to see what they have inside. It's just, they know more or less the value based on where you are delivering. So they know that you are going to deliver to this pharmacy. We know that this pharmacy is in a rich area and that's how they charge. And this is why we don't see here any correlation. And this is what I was just saying before, because something we wanted to know was, is extortion the the, the amount that they pay, does it uh, depend on the number of stops along the same route that this uh, driver is doing? I want to see that much evidence of a correlation. Yeah. We also try to see other measures. And here's where we don't have that much good data because this is uh, integrated. So we use this nightlight density to try to see if it's positively correlated with extortion. And actually we see that that's the case. We also, uh, check the value of deliveries and there is a positive correlation there. 
So it seems that extortion is positively correlated with this kind of proxies for downstream demand. We also do it with population density, and we see that there is where they are trying high extortion rates. Then we also saw, wanted to see, okay, how does this correlate with homicide rates? So what we see is that it is positively correlated with gang violence. This is homicide committed by gangs. But interestingly, we see a negative, a positive correlation also with competition. The more they compete, the more extortion they are doing. This has a correlation, no? And now you may be thinking, wait, but you talked before that your main result, well, this is just the cross-sectional data. In the cross-section, we see that places that have higher competition are also high, higher extortion rates, but also places that have higher uh, extortion rates are those that have higher downstream demand. So we don't know what is causing that. That's why we need that experiment. I think this is, I already said it exactly. So let's move now to uh, the exogenous variation. So what we do, so we explore two sources of variation and the two are important. The first one is the timing of this 2016 non-aggression pact. And then the other one is this cross-sectional variation in gun competition before the pact. And in the next slide, I'm going to tell you how we define this competition because this is key on what Horacio and Paula were asking before. And basically we do the typical diff in diff where we interact these two sources of variation and our outcome of interest extortion rate for an extortion payment, mainly in a root R in municipality D at month D. So this is month D. And we include municipality and time fixed effects, month fixed effects. And this is very interesting because when we were thinking about gun competition, and uh, we know that in this context, gangs, if they compete, they compete with violence. So what we do is to use these police reports that contain detailed data on homicides. So the police can determine which gang is responsible for each homicide whenever they can. So basically what we are thinking is that if both can commit homicides in an area, it means that they are competing. So what we do is we do this HHI index using the share of homicides committed by each gang in three years prior to a non-aggression pact. So what we do for the baseline specifications Mika? is- Mika? Yes. Hi. Um, just a quick question. How, how worried are you about misreporting of homicides and the variation, the cross-sectional variation? In, in misreporting? That's a good uh, question because actually there is a lot of misreporting. So what we try to check whether the pact was affecting that and we don't see any, any correlation with that. So at least in that sense, we know that this is not affecting the results. It's not that we are now seeing more uh, underreporting or more missing due to after the, the, the agreement. Yeah. yeah, I guess, I guess yes. uh, what, what I'm more... Uh, curious about is how that would impact the uh, your measure of competition. Ah, okay, that's yes. What we do so actually we we use as a secondary measure is we also have in the incarceration records of individuals and the gang that they belong. So we validate this measure with these incarceration records where we know that the measurement error is very little because they are when once you enter jails. They know very well or whether you are from MS-13 or neighborhood 18 due to your tattoos or where you are from. So they do much more in that. It's, it's, it's the one that is uh, better. So we validate with that one as well. So that's what the two things that we can do to try to validate this measure. Yeah. I have a, a quick yes. related question, which is, is it, is it possible that the non-aggression packs change how kind of police are monitoring gangs or reporting on gangs? Is there a concern that the measure changes in response to the pact itself? Yes, this is what I was just telling Rosella, Jeremy. So what we do is to try to see whether this varies, the measure, like after, like whether the missing, then the reporting uh, observations that we have, like the missing, whether they increase or not after the pact. And we don't find any evidence of that. That's okay, the, sorry, the best we could do. Thanks. No, mm. but perfect, thank you. All, all these comments are super valid because as you know, when you work like with illegal actors, it's like you have to look for all these proxies about like in competition, but okay. So, but we think that this one can be good given that they, in general, they use violence to compete. And as I was saying, so the baseline specification competition will be equal to one if the HHI index is in the top quarto and 
one otherwise. And we are going, I'm going to try to show you also to alternative cutoff, also using the continuous measure, and also to this other measure of competition, as I said before, using incarceration records. So the first thing that we want to do is to validate the measure of competition. So I was telling you before that places where gangs are competing, they have higher homicides. And this is what you see at least in baseline. Here, these are the places that qualify as having competition in baseline. They have, in level, sorry, they have higher uh, gang homicide. And we also want to see if after the pact, these are the places that are seeing a bigger decline. And this is the case. We see that the non narration pact actually reduced about 30% uh, the homicide rates. And this decrease is mainly in areas defined as having competition in the pre period. We also check whether this affects other crimes in general, like death, robbery, domestic violence, and we don't see any effects. So this tells you that also there is no change of enforcement after the pact, because if not, you would see that also these other crimes would be declining. Well, then we check uh, our main outcome of interest, which is the extortion rates. And we actually see evidence that well before there was no increase and then after the pact we start seeing this increase of about 20 percent so this is what we do so these results arose like to a number of specific regulations as I said, the baseline is only controlling where municipality and month fixed effects then we can also include since we know the root we can put root fixed effect the results partly change we include a bunch of covariates such as population density, census municipality characteristics before the pact interacted with year, the results do not change. We also um, include this municipality route fixed effects, so we are comparing within the municipality route the different extortion payments, and the results are almost unchanged. So it seems that at least in intensive margin, this increased the rate. Yes, Nicola. Okay. So, How are you? I don't know, maybe you're. Um getting this, I was curious if there's any way to compare or test whether the change in um, sort of extortion is consistent with changing from you know, oligopolistic or you know, partially competitive pricing mm -hmm. to like jointly colluding on, on price, or if you think that it's instead the fact the environment is now not violent that somehow changes like the production of extortion payments. So I guess in, in the first case, it would be like they agreed to non-aggression. And at the same time, they said, hey, now that we're sort of not fighting each other, why don't we set the you know, monopoly extortion rate rather than like competing on extortion rates? I know you said that's not exactly the right way because they have different territories, but maybe mm -hmm. there's something like that going on. Um, on the second part, maybe it's, well, now the environment is less violent and you mentioned like redeploying your resources or you know ha having sort of more people to... Um, deployed to extortion. And so that is like, less violence changes the extortion technology. And I was just curious how you think about the distinction between these ideas. Yes, so how we try, we try to do things. So what we do to try to validate, so to rule out the first one is first is that we don't see that they are, uh, that the company like for a delivery choose different, like they pay different gangs. They are always paying one or the other. And also the fact that they told us that they don't choose for the second one about the production function, which is, so we have something, and I will come back to this, like I think it's in two slides, like that we try, it's not the perfect measure, but we try to see whether threats related to extortion increase, the timing that they spend negotiating, that you may think that now it can increase because now there are more people, they are extorting you, and that those more or less are the checks, but I will go on those in, I think, two slides. We also check the extensive margin, whether the probability so, sorry, oh, can yes. I just a clarification question? Yes, yes, yes. What is the left hand side of this uh, equation exactly? Uh, yes, so here is uh, the extortion amount, how much they are paying. Okay, so in a root municipality more. Mm -hmm. And here is the number of payments in a particular route that the driver is going in a municipality in each month. So when you say extortion rate, uh, yes, it, it's the amount. But then since I put it in log, that's why I, I was... I see. But, but uh, I don't know if you can do it or if you tried it. Uh, suppose mm -hmm. 
you do the amount divided by the value of the delivery. Yes. No, we haven't tried it. Because that would be the relevant price. And I was wondering, you know, uh, going back to the question that Nick asked, which is also related to yes. what I was asking before, I was wondering whether you see, because, because if there is a, you know, an increased monopoly power, mm -hmm. then, uh, that price should go up. You know, the, the, where I define the price as the, as the rate, as what you said about it. And the, you show at the beginning there is uh, the amount distorted depends on the, the value of uh, mm -hmm. you know, delivering a medicine that is worth a thousand dollars. You probably pay more than you have delivering aspirin. Yes. So, so I was wondering whether the rate goes uh, up. No, I we haven't checked it. So it, that's uh, something that we could do definitely, because we check separately. Let me see. No, we haven't seen this. No, as rates, I, I'm just trying to think about all the nice with it, and we haven't looked at this. So it's definitely something that we could do. And just one thing, why that would roll out this, uh, this economies of scope story that I was saying before about the resources moving, because it should also no, increase. Value. But I can think more about this, sorry. Like I, I am the one, <laughs> I know more about the paper. So this is even me, I don't know like the answer on the spot. So, but definitely we could do that to try to see how, how, how this varies because we have the data, so. Uh, okay, ah, yes, I was just talking about the number of extortion payments that they do. And while there is a means of an increase, it's not that consistent. So in the extensive margin, it seems that it's not, at least it's not that robust. This is suggestive that it's increasing. And we actually asked about this to the distribution company. And what they were mentioning is that in general for delivery is uh, they are not stopped like multiple times, even for it by the same gang to do a deliver. In general, they are stopped, you know, the block before they are going to do a delivery. That's how, how it works. So maybe that's why we are not seeing that much effects here. So, and this is the question that we were just discussing is why does extortion increase with when gun colludes? And this is where we have this, uh, we, we are mostly basing this in our qualitative evidence. And then we have a conceptual framework in the paper that highlights this gang side, this economies of the scope, which basically is, as gangs are not fighting with the rival gangs, they now can allocate more resources, gang members or time to extortion. What do we find of evidence of this is, well, the first one is that if they are putting more resources to extortion, we should see an increase in gang threats related to extortion. And also kidnappings is something that happens or the privation of liberty is uh, when they, you know, I stop you for an amount of time, uh, time and I don't let you move from that location, which is something that happens a lot with drivers and with people when they don't want to pay. And we actually see an increase of those. Then the other thing that I don't know why it's not showing here my, my click, but just trust me that this increase. And the second thing that we were thinking that may happen is that the degree of the price discrimination may change because now gangs may have better information no, on retailers and associated demand for delivered goods. Since I'm not fighting, now I can know better how much is the price of those goods that you're going to deliver. And actually, we see some evidence of that. We see that gangs increase extortion more for deliveries that uh, are retailers with higher value of delivery. And the third thing that we find is this that I was talking before is that if they are taking longer time to negotiate because now they have more people there per stop, this should take longer, no? The, the delivery. So, and we actually see that an increase in the delivery times between the extortion payments and the delivery consistent again with this idea of more negotiations, negotiations and call up by gangs after the fact. We also try to explore other explanations, as I was saying, this is just suggestive, this mechanism, we're working on this. So any feedback that you can give about how to try to disentangle these different mechanisms we were just discussing before with Nick and Horacio are welcome. We so rule out, yes. Given that you asked for the question, I will, yes. uh, I will uh, do it. Uh, when you, what do you mean by price, price discrimination exactly? What do you have in mind? Yes, basically whether they are charging a, a fixed fee per delivery or if they are varying based on the value of the deliveries. 
of the base on the if they vary the extortion amount based on where they are delivered. And this is what I'm seeing in the data, what we are seeing. Yeah, because again, I think the data on the rates, so the ratio between the extortion amount and how much it is value, from the value. It would be quite interesting here. Because suppose that you find it everywhere like 10%. Yes. Um, so it is kind of, yeah. Yeah, there could be a, a situation Same. where it's not 10% everywhere, but depending on, uh, so, yeah, some sort of elasticity of demand for the services, so to speak. Yes. Uh, then uh, then you would charge more or less, and that's, the, that's what I interpret as price discrimination. Yeah, we should do definitely the thing of the of the rate that you suggested. Yeah, Rosella. Yeah. So, um, do you? I mean, how should I think about any response in terms of the types of delivery or the values of delivery? Because that's also endogenous, right? So there might be an adjustment in how much valuable am I uh, deciding to to ship uh, for every trip because I know now that there is going to be more extortion. No, yes, that's very important. And actually, we, uh, this is actually the, the, I think it's the third bullet. So okay. basically, the firm can adjust. So once they are facing this, the distribution company face the, this increase in extortion rates, they can adjust via prices, charging like a higher delivery fee to the retailers or to just not deliver or change the, the goods that they are delivering. We didn't find any change of those, whether the number of deliveries, uh, the number of retailers, even the cost of the goods didn't change. So we were surprised about this because we thought that, so we went back to the firm and we asked like, look, we are seeing, and they were like, well, we cannot change that much. Like they, what they mentioned is that they don't have that margin to change that because first they are the exclusive uh, distribution of some of these goods. And also they have long-standing delivery contracts with retailers. That sometimes when, when, when they have to renew it, they try to negotiate some, uh, some things there. But in general, I say that that's very difficult for them to do. Okay, there are also other things that can be going on. One that is very direct is that this pact also reduces uh, the violence, the uh, increased security, because now you don't have people shooting or homicide. So this can have a direct effect on uh, on extortion as well. You know? Now they can pay you more because they're providing like more safety. There is also an increase in demand. And actually we see whether with household service, whether household income, expenditures, and also again, we check nightlights and we don't see any effect, at least in the short run. Remember that all this is actually like just months after the, the pact, we don't find any effect. It's possible that in the long run, there would be an, uh, a change in demand, but at least in the short run, we are not seeing. Uh, the other is the one that we were just discussing about this, whether the firm now is having less choice now, because now it has only one gang in that territory, so they cannot, uh, they cannot choose after the pact. But actually, as I was saying before, the conversation with the firm highlight that firms cannot choose which gang to pay, instead firms must pay whichever gang is in control of the territory. The best we could do here, because something that is uh, the bad side of our data is that we don't have for all the period to which gang they pay. But we can see it for 2019 data, and there we see that they are only paying like only one gang at the time. We also explore which are the places that we see the highest increase in extortion. And actually, we find some evidence that gangs tend to increase extortion the most in this uh, neighborhood with higher downstream demand. Again, this is measured by this uh, with population density and nightlight density as a measure of development. And also we use the total sales. And we see that those are the places where they are more likely to be increasing the extortion. So what I have shown you so far, I show you that uh, can collude this increased extortion rates. It's higher in places with higher downstream demand. I show you some suggestive evidence that effects can be driven by a shift in resources towards extortion. We also check whether the effects are robots to alternative cutoffs. And we see that more or less it's always a 20% increase in, in extortion. 
we also try to check whether uh, whether the effects replicate because right now we are doing all the analysis at the municipality road level and we try to check what happens if we look at the neighborhood level at the canton level which would be a, a bit like more similar to neighborhood level municipality you can think as county like in the u.s and canton level could be a uh, more like neighborhood and we see that the effects replicate pretty well there so now Let's see what happens, which is the film response to this extortion. So what are the downstream consequences of extortion? And here we have two approaches, which are mainly limited by the data that we have. The first one is uh, we could use distribution sales data, which, uh, which has this distribution margin, which is basically the difference between the revenue they pay and the procurement cost, how much they are paying the multinational. And we can think about this as the delivery fee what they pay for delivery. With pharmacy sales data, what I would like to show you is that we can do better because with pharmacy sales data, we can we get access to other admin data sets that has the prices per drug. So there we can see whether prices respond. But let's see first whether they are, uh, what they are doing to these retailers as the distribution company. So the first thing that we do is again, the reduced form where now the outcome of interest is the log of the distribution margin. Just think about this as the delivery fee. And what we see is that, that when gangs cooperate after the pact, there is an increase of 12% in distribution margins, especially for those deliveries that occur closest to the extortion payments, so the ones that are linked to that extortion. We also do the IV definitive, but this is only, again, since we know that this could not be the only mechanism, is just to quantify the effects, and here, what we see is that for $1 increase in extortion, this increases the uh, firm distribution margin by 0 0.8 for the deliveries that are closest to extortion payment. So this is very high. Then we also wanted to see, OK, are there heterogeneous effects uh, in increase in extortion by product type? <coughs> and remember, as similar as I saw you in the descriptive, it's not that the increase in extortion varies by the tab type of products. However, when we check the distribution margin, how much they pay, there are heterogeneous. There is some evidence that is suggestive that there is a larger increase for, uh, for those products that are uh, for more inelastic products. Okay, So this is just uh, suggestive, but at least something that basically a distribution company, if they have to increase uh, the cost, they do it much more for this retailers. We also check these other film responses to extortion. For example, the extensive margin, as we were just before Rosella was asking whether they change the number of deliveries, nothing there, the total cost that they pay. If this is driven, you know that now there is higher demand, there should be an increase also in the cost because they are demanding more from the multinationals, nothing there, the number of the new products, new retailers, no evidence of a change of the institution company on the extensive margin. So the next thing that we wanted to, to know is use this pharmacy data. As I was telling you before, another way that we can see the pass through consumers is by checking prices. The problem with the data that we have of the distribution company is that we don't have the prices that all these retailers uh, are selling to consumers. So we use this data on pharmacy sales, which is a subset of the market that the distribution company uh, delivers. And interestingly, in this case of El Salvador, they have the highest drug prices in Central America. So this potentially reduces access to drugs. So it's important per se actually to understand why they have this very high prices. So what we have, and actually this is important because you may wonder why are the, why the government is collecting all this data. And actually it's because of this, is that they are having all this information now, which is basically National Directory of Medicines of El Salvador from 2014 to 2017 which has like super detailed uh, data on quantity, revenue by pharmacy for over all the products uh, defined as molecular brand size. So this is very rich data. If you want to work with pharmacy in El Salvador, it's, it's pretty good. So what we do from this data is we take out the prices. So here, the first thing that we try to see is do prices increase after the non-aggression pact, the prices of these drugs? And we see that, yes, we see about an 8% increase in retail prices for pharmaceuticals. We try to see whether there are differential effects, whether 
uh, you are distributed by our company or others just to try to see whether it, this is something particular of our distribution company or not. And we don't see any differential effect, which is consistent with what I was telling you before, that when we talk to these other companies, that even though they didn't want to share the data, they talked to us about how this worked. And it was very similar, the mechanisms that they have, having the security team that would negotiate with gangs. So that's why we are not seeing differential effects. We also check, in, and this, uh, the price for drugs for chronic diagnosis, because these are, uh, as the name says, they are like uh, illnesses that you really need the medicines, like diabetes or respiratory problems. And we do this because we wanted to see, okay, how much this increase in prices end up affecting consumers. And the way that we have to see this is uh, this other data on health, which has uh, all the information of all individual level data on admissions at public health facilities. And this covers almost 95% of the market. And it has information on the data they were admitted, the diagnosis code, so everything that you want, they have it. And they have it from 2012 to 2019. And what we see is that admissions in general, they don't increase, no? In, if anything, we would think that there would be a negative effect on injuries because now you're not having this homicide by gangs. We see some evidence not significant, but when you look at admissions for this uh, chronic diagnosis that really need uh, you to take the drugs, we see an increase of about 8%. So basically, there is an increase in hospital admissions for chronic conditions that need to be treated by the drugs that we analyze in this table. So for these same drugs that we see at prices, so we link them to the, uh, to the chronic diagnosis that needs those drugs, and we see also an increase. Okay, I went super fast, so be free to, <laughs> to interrupt before I do the conclusions. But this that was the last set of results that I wanted to show you. Okay. Uh, Mika, Mika, yes. Just a quick question. Um, yeah. Would you be able to do like some sort of back of the envelope calculation on how much money or what it would be a subsidy to these types of, uh, of drugs uh, that would sort of curb this, this negative or yes. prices, right? And, and, and whether that would, meet, that would make economically more sense than trying to avoid the extortion in the first place. Yes, that, we have it in our to-do list. And I think that that would be super important because at the end of the day, you have that these facts are reducing no homicide, which is also very important for welfare of these populations. So knowing how much you need to give, and that's why we are, we are thinking that uh, something nice with this data is that you can see which are the products that are more likely to be affected, which are the areas so that the government can target once they do those this type of, uh, of well, in this case, it was not the government that negotiated this, it was just the, the gangs, but in general, governments try to do this or basically negotiate with gangs to reduce violence without thinking about the business. So I think all this point is super important. Thank you. Yeah, can I? Yes. Can you go back to the um, table with the uh, with the effect on prices? Yes. Yeah. So, so first of all, just to make sure that I understand it well. Yes. Uh, the seven percent is an effect of your uh, is your diff and diff thing. Yes. Yes. So, so it's not the rate by which, you know, it doesn't go down to zero. So it's probably the cost is larger. Uh, yes, this is what we are, we are inferring is that they are charging. Uh, so basically since these retailers now face this increase in the delivery cost, they need to increase prices. Yeah, Sometimes yeah, but uh, the, that cost was there before, so it's, uh, and again, it would be interesting to compare that with the um, uh, with so to get a handle of the pass through. So if he if this company has to pay fifteen percent of the mm -hmm. of uh, the delivery, uh, if, uh, does that uh, how much of that is transferred to the consumers? The same. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, yeah, so that, that would be an interesting exercise. Yes, because probably in those places that they have a higher value, it depends, no? Like if they are having 
which will also be related with the with the how inelastic is the demand for certain products. Yeah. Know how much they are. Yeah, I, I definitely we could do the, the rate that you suggested there as well. Yeah, it depends on depends on the market power also. The, uh, yes. Uh, and actually, that's uh, it's very interesting because something that we haven't explored, but we are thinking of doing is who are the ones that react now with increasing prices? Whether you face, you know, competition. We haven't talked at all about competition at the retailer or pharmacy level, no, because this can also affect how much they can increase prices or not. And the other thing that we haven't talked about is about firm exit and uh, and entry, and that's something that we are now trying to systematize that data. So we can explore also that dimension as well. Okay, just to conclude, and you can keep ask, uh, asking questions because uh, for me it, it's super helpful. So basically, what we have, as I was saying before, is that this thing of cooperations and trusts is something that governments do a lot. It's not only in Central America; we have seen this in South Africa, in many other countries. And what we try to show here is that the comparison can also allow gangs to increase their extortion rates, which uh, are passed through to retailers and also consumers. So what we are trying to show here is something that consumers can be a large burden of this upstream extortion. So the idea here is that we provide some insight on the economics of gangs, how uh, price discrimination and gangs can have implications for the incidence of extortion, which are the places where uh, extortion is increased the most as we just were discussing. And also the market structure of extortion is important for the design of anti-extortion policies. And this is related to what we were mentioning before with Rosel about whether we need to think about different subsidies based on the products that are affected the most. And that's all for today. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for the feedback and feel free to ask any question because I went super fast. <laughs> Yes, Angela. Hi, th thanks so much for this great, great talk. I'll um, I'll start by admitting that I, I'm not an economist. I'm uh, soon to be a lawyer, so this this question um, might might well sound um, novice to some ears here. But I'm curious about um, whether, in the course of this research, um, you encountered or took in into account in any way. Um, extortion of the extortion at the point of sale, um, say at the pharmacy, individual pharmacy level. Um, it's a super good question, Angela, because yeah, yeah. actually I haven't talked about that. And yes, in the case of pharmacies, actually no, because somehow they say that gangs don't go and extort pharmacies. Again, this is not something because I don't have information on direct extortion that the retailers and pharmacies face. This is based on qualitative evidence. But I do know that they also go and extort small shops. And so these retailers may face also extortion on their own. So this can be also the result of this. Yeah, so I guess my, my then question that I think maybe links more closely to the argument you're advancing here is whether any of the outcomes you're observing um, are impacted not just by the extortion payment um, of the truckers, but also at the final point of sale. Yes, it's possible that yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we think that for the price that I'm showing that is pharmaceutical, no, based on this, but again, this is qualitative evidence of gangs saying that they don't extort pharmacies, but who knows? When you ask, maybe they are like they are. I haven't done a survey there of pharmacies, yeah, but definitely, yes. Thank you. David. Or David, sorry, <laughs> I pronounced uh, it. David is okay, yeah. Uh, hi, Mika, thank you so much. This this was great, especially in this kind of literature that I know uh, is super hard to find uh, data with this kind of detail. So that was great. Um, mine is not a question on your paper. It's more like on a question on what do you think? Um, I'm thinking on how to put your second result in on discussion with the this long literature and extortion that has shown that competition and violence is typically associated with uh, higher rates of extortion, right? Uh, because typically what we think is like uh, higher competition creates this necessity for these criminal actors to increase uh, extortion as a um, major income source, a source of income, right? Uh, yes. In your case, what I'm thinking is like, this is not um, 
because your exogenity comes from a reduction in violence and a reduction in competition, mm -hmm. you can't say anything about the, that other literature. But if we put together both literatures, basically what we have is like any one of a reduction in violence or an increase in violence, both increase extortion rates. So maybe what we have here is that extortion suffers of something like a ratchet effect in which criminal actors tend to increase extortion rates, but they never decrease ex extortion rates in any case. So I don't know, like I'm trying to, again, because this is a very large literature. Uh, there yes, 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 like for instance, when there is war, that they will like increase taxes. Exactly, taxi, the like new, new Moncada's book that includes some case studies in El Salvador and this kind of thing. So how to put together those kind of results that seem counterintuitive at the same point or like I'm that going to uh, like opposite directions, but I, I don't think they are like really contradictory. Um, yeah, no, yeah, right. definitely. Thank you for this comment. Thanks a lot. I don't know if there is any other comment. If not, thank you so much. And feel free to email me, like even if you are, I don't know, you're a student and you want to do research on this and you need access to data, I can help you. <laughs> and I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions. And thank you so much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to present, at least through Zoom. Thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Michaela, and a uh, pleasure to have you. So no, thank you, Teresa, for inviting me. Okay. Bye. I hope to see you in person soon, <laughs> hopefully, at some point. Bye-bye. Bye, Mika. Bye.